Freddie Harvey? Can you read the back? Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm Mike Chan. I'm a neurosurgeon here in Sacramento. I joined the practice about nine years ago. And uh, she, she said, I grew up in California, so here I am. Uh, can you go <coughs> next slide, please? So tonight we're talking about Chiari type 1. So there's actually a Chiari type 2, a type 3, a type 4, and possibly a type 0. I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff. Uh, the main ones that are interesting is type 1 and type 2. Type 2 is a much bigger topic, much more involved. So if you are interested in it, stay tuned for next year. Today we're talking about type 1. And that's the stuff that I treat. Uh, it's actually named after a pathologist, an Austrian pathologist named Hans Chiari. And Dr. Chiari basically noticed during these autopsies of patients that they had this deformity in their posterior uh, back of the head and the brain. And then he went back to the medical record and they said, they all have these symptoms. I wonder are they related? And at some point, they put two and two together and they came out with PR type 1. Uh, next slide, please. Hey, are there any neuroanatomists in here? No? 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 Wait a minute. Someone's putting their hand up and saying yes. <laughs> no. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll take that a no. So just because there's not a lot of neuroanatomy, it's really hard to understand something like Chiari unless you know some basic neuroanatomy. So this is actually a photo that I took my, uh, my camera of a reference atlas called Netter. And so this is basically the brain. This is the patient standing like this. Side view, you can see the nose, the forehead, the brain, and here's the back of the head. Uh, here's the base of the skull. Here's the top of the spine. So this is the neck. Thing up here is what we think of as brain, it's the cerebrum, that's the main brain. Right here, this funny looking bird looking thing is actually called the primitive brain or the brain stem. And this guy right here controls all your basic functions, like your eye movements, your awakefulness, your blinking, your smell, your swallowing, your walking, your heartbeat, your breathing, all the stuff that you don't think about, that's considered primitive functions, automatic functions. This primitive reptilian brain handles, so this is the brain stem. Back here, this funny looking peach thing is actually the cerebellum. It is the little brain, and it's actually the area of coordination. So when you walk, the swing of your legs, the balance of the limb like this, that's all cerebellum. So it's used for coordination. Um, there's also pockets of fluid all over the place. And CSF is actually, well for us today, it's Chiari Cerebral Myelia Foundation. But before that, it was called cerebral spinal fluid, and that's for fluid in the brain, the cerebral, and fluid in the spine, the spinal fluid. And it's basically just water, and the whole brain floats in this cushion of water. And like all water, whether it's a river or an ocean, there's a flow to it. Uh, next slide, please. So let's take a look at this. This actually looks at just the pockets of fluid in the brain. So I would remove everything else and kind of shadow the ghost a picture. This is what they call the ventricular system. So there's four ventricles, and they're basically pockets of fluid of the CSF. So there's these two big lateral horns, a third ventricle, a fourth ventricle, and then from there it kind of flows down to the spinal cord. And just like we need um, air conditioning to keep the air circulating, this fluid keeps a very, very stable environment in the brain and the spinal cord to keep the pH, the, the sugar, and all that stuff. You want to keep it stable for the brain. Plus it also offers the cushion itself. Uh, next slide, please. So what this fluid does is actually it flows through, and there's a very, very stereotypical flow formation. Some of the folks who had seen me, we did a study called the STEMI study, which I'm going to talk more about later. But basically, you see all these little arrows here, and that shows the direction that the fluid goes. And these arrows aren't randomly put. They actually flow a certain way, and you can see right up in that corner right there, the arrow going into those little mushrooms that leaves the brain and into these blood vessels, and that's how you get rid of the fluid. But you see the fluid actually comes down and around all this area. Um, so the flow of the fluid is kind of important because we're going to talk about problems that will form if you block the fluids. Uh, next slide, please. So coming back to this slide, I want to draw your attention to some part of the anatomy that is very special today, and that is the posterior fossa. So if you can see, there's a big compartment here, that's the supertutorial or the anterior fossa, and there's a little compartment right here, so a smaller compartment, and that's the posterior fossa. And that's what we're going to focus on today because that's the area where PR malformations occur. So here at the base of the skull, so this is bone, and that's bone, and what, there's no bone here. And what it is is just a hole, and it's called the frame magnum. And that's where all this critical structure comes through, which is the brainstem. It becomes the spinal cord. So this area right here kind of transitions in. And you see right here, there's only just spinal cord. There's nothing else here. 
And that's kind of what we want to see in a normal person. And just to correlate MRIs to anatomy, we kind of have an idea of what's going on with this picture. Let's move over here, and you can see there's a really nice correlation between the anatomy of an MRI and the anatomy of the brain itself. So let's kind of ignore that guy right here and kind of look here. So this is what they call an MRI, the side view, once again, it's like this, and just to orient you, your tongue, your nose, your forehead, the back of the head, the top of your spine, brain stem, the little reptilian brain, and the cerebellum, the little brain, and you can see the edge of the bone here, the edge of the bone there, you can see the edge of the bone here, and again, the edge of the bone here, and you can see a defect right there that we call the frame magnum, or a big hole, the base of the skull. Same thing here, there's a big hole here, and this particular patient is normal. So you can see the brain stem right there, the cerebellum is right there, you've got the fourth ventricle, you got CSF all around it, this looks pretty normal. Uh, next slide, please. So now I've kind of demarcated where the frame magnum is, and I actually, for those of you who still can't see what I'm talking about, next slide. Here's a skull in my operating room, and some of the folks that came to my, I mean, not in my operating room, in my office, some of the folks that uh, has been to my office have seen the skull. Um, so basically, here's the jaw of the skull, here's the teeth, we're looking in that direction, and you see a hole right at the base of the skull, back here. So this right here is right here. And so here's looking underneath, and we'll never see this in real life because basically you chop the head off and you look from underneath. <laughs> here's the jaw, here's the mouth, the back of the head is up there. You see this big hole right here. That's the frame magnum. That's the, the big, well, I guess big hole. The magnum is big and frame is hole. So that's the big hole. And in a normal person, spinal cord and spinal fluid is the only thing coming through here. You don't want anything here because there's not much room in here. You don't want to jam it up. Uh, next slide, please. So let's take a look at this. This person is not in the room right now. There's not anybody in here, in case you're wondering. But it is a person that I've treated in the past. This is also a, a random person that you can see right here, the frame magnum, uh, the, the brain stem, the spinal cord, cerebellum, and you can see the yellow line where the frame magnum is. That's the big hole. And you look here, well, here's the yellow line should be here, and you can see there's clearly something right here jammed up between here and here between here and here. So it's just brainstem and spinal cord here. You got brainstem and spinal cord plus this big hunk of cerebellum. We call this a tonsil. It's kind of a tonsil in the throat, but because it hangs down, we call it cerebellar tonsil. And you can see it's pretty jammed up. This gray hash right here, that's just spinal fluid. That's empty space. Here, I don't see it. Uh, can we go back one slide? Uh, one more. So the other thing I draw your attention to is right here, that's the first cervical bone, C1. And you can see it right here, there's C1 in cross-section. So that bone's are right at the base of your skull. Uh, two slide forward, please. Yeah. And so you can see C1 right here in cross-section. So that's the first bone in your neck. Here's the second bone, the third bone, the fourth bone, the fifth bone. And the same thing here. The first bone, the little dot in the front and back, the second bone, the third bone. And you can see, between C1 and the base of the skull is empty space in a normal person. But here, between C1 and the base of the skull, there's a big hunk of brain squishing on the spinal cord. And that gives you a lot of symptoms. So the way the head and the body works, think of it as a little person. The eyes are here, the legs are here, the stomach and all that stuff is here. And that's how the functions are. This part of the brainstem controls your eyes and your eye movement. This part of the brainstem controls your leg and your, your breathing and all that stuff. So if you squash this part, you're going to affect some of that lower function, what we in nurse would call long track signs, which affects your balance and things of that nature. Swallowing is all down here. Uh, one slide forward, please. So Chiari type 1. So like I said, we're going to skip Chiari type 2, 3, 4, and 0. But Chiari type 1 basically is a hodgepodge of symptoms. It's basically just a miscellaneous pot of things. So one person with Chiari may have some symptoms similar to another person. But one person with Chiari may have completely different symptoms, but they're, they're all Chiaris. So uh, this slide talks about how it can be congenital or acquired. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, usually you see the consoles in the furry magnum. So this yellow line, again, demarcates the furry magnum, the big hole at the base of the skull. And you can see that there's a hunk of brain sitting there on the tonsils. So tonsils in the furry magnum is kind of what we see on MRI radiographically. Uh, Stringomyelia, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. That does occur in some 20% of patients. And like all fluids, we have fluids on the outside and inside of our brain, fluid on the outside and inside of the spinal cord, and we'll talk about what happens when the fluid 
inside the brain gets trapped and when the fluid inside the spinal cord gets trapped. Actually, I don't talk too much about the hydrocephalus, so I'm going to talk about that right now. If you basically have fluid trapped inside your brain, you get what they call water in the brain. And you get hydrocephalus, and that expands your brain and squashes it and makes patients feel really sick. Um, this type of tiara is an adult onset. So those, for those of you guys who know what a type 2 is, that's really the, the, the adolescent onset, little kids. And you see them in little child, newborn sometimes. But this really in the older folks. Uh, next slide, please. So how do you get Chiari? So the most common thing, and I tell all my patients, you are born with this. And that's true. Most of the time, it's congenital. You are born with it. Why? Because that posterior fossa back here could be a little bit smaller. This is a membrane separating the top and the bottom called a tentorium or a tent. If that tent is a little bit low, it could actually cause this to squish out. You can have a thick skull, so thick-headed, or thick occipital bone. that can push this brain down. You can have a mass lesion, like a raccoon cyst or a tumor. And People are born with these sometimes. That can push it down. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit harder is, or uh, more rare, is acquired uh, Chiara. That's when you're not born with it, you grow up, and for whatever reason, you develop it. And I actually took care of a patient three weeks ago that developed this because her neck was so deformed. It actually pulled her brain down and squashed her tonsils right in the front of the magnum. So that was pretty unusual. I've never seen that before. Uh, so brain hemorrhage, if you bleed here, you can imagine the blood expands and pushes your brain down, and it'll squash it out, and that'll crush that. That's a herniation, or a moving of the brain out of the skull in a very abnormal fashion. That can be acquired. Hydrocephalus, when you have water in your brain trapped, you can have so much pressure, it pushes the brain out. And again, it impinges this part of the brain stem. That can be a problem. Tumors, shunts. So what are shunts? Some of you guys know what shunts are, and others don't. So basically, shunt is a device that people like me, doctors and neurosurgeons use to suck fluid on the brain and the spinal cord. And sometimes you suck too much, you can cause it to sag. And when that happens, you can develop brain herniation or Chiari. Uh, next slide, please. So who gets the Chiaris? Uh, amazingly, even though most of my patients are pretty young, the average age of presentation is 41 years old and 12 to 73 years old. The oldest person that I ever saw that came to me with a Chiari was in their 60s. Uh, it's slightly higher female preponderance, so 1.3 female to 1 male. And time to presentation, so a lot of these patients, they have three years of symptoms until someone said, hey, you might have a Chiari. So they can go on for years, sometimes 10 years, sometimes shorter, but for the most part, about three to five years is what I usually see. Uh, next slide, please. So what are some of the symptoms? So again, <coughs> the symptoms is not because that's what happens. It's just because what's being squashed presents. So one patient can have something squashed, the other patient has something else squashed, and it presents very differently. But a lot of patients they do have pain. Headaches is the most common. Back of the head, 34% uh, have headaches, and then 13% is really exclusively back here. A lot of my patients, they usually say, yeah, it starts here, and it goes forward. And I hear that a lot. Uh, so pain is definitely one of the more common presentations. Shoulder pain, so all this is kind of connected the brain, the spinal cord, the muscles, the head, the skull, all that. You can see pain in the shoulders, in the arms, and pretty rarely in the legs. I have to say, in the last 15, 20 years, I've never had someone who presented with pain in the legs. Doesn't mean it can't happen, though. Uh, next slide, please. So other symptoms, weakness. Definitely, a lot of our patients do have some funny weakness. A lot of times, they just think that, hey, my hands are kind of funny, or maybe I'm dropping things, so they're not really in tune with that. Numbness. Very common in my patient populations for several reasons. Number one, this is your relay station. Whatever you feel goes from your spinal cord up to your brain. And if you're pushing on that, you're basically blocking the sensation from getting to your brain so you can't feel things. Temperature sensation, very similar, similar pathway. If you squash this right here, you can actually interrupt the sensation from getting much higher. You can lose some of that. St unsteadiness is because, once again, all this muscles, uh, coordination and balance. So about all this has to get through this one roadblock. And if you squash it, you're going to lose some of that function. So some patients do have unsteadiness. I actually remember a patient who came in looking like they had a spinal cord injury and they had what we call a magnetic gait. So they would just kind of walk like this. And they really couldn't balance. They looked drunk because this was so bad. It was actually squashed. And this was a completely different color from all the bruising. Uh, double vision. Double vision is possible. Um, this part controls the vision. There's one part in this part of your brain called the pons that controls the vision, and there are all these nerves go through. 
And if you have a higher pressure in the head, it's going to squeeze your nerves. If those nerves get squeezed, they don't work well. And if your nerves to your right eye and nerves to your left eye aren't perfectly lined up, you're going to get double vision. So that does happen. Swallowing issues, only 8%, but surprisingly, a different amount of patients complain about it because their swallowing mechanism is right there. And basically, your brain's kind of called the medulla. If you lose that function, you may say, I think I choke sometimes. If, if I try to talk, everybody else talks and eats, but I can't. So they, they notice some of the things. So I actually see that a little bit more in my patient population. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, ringing in the ears. I actually have a patient who had that. Vomiting, surprisingly, at 5% is not a lot. Uh, a lot of patients do have some nausea because as the pressure goes up in your head, you feel like throwing up. And that's just how our body works. So surprisingly, only 5% for that. Dizziness, hearing problems. Again, right here, this part of the brain controls your hearing. Fainting, I think, relates to the whole pressure in the head. Facial numbness and hiccups. So if you have hiccups, you probably need brain surgery. Right? So that's pretty rare. I've never, I've never seen that. Uh, but that's what was reported. Uh, next slide, please. So why are these symptoms? Once again, here's your brain stuff. This controls a lot of these basic functions. You're swallowing, you're talking, your balance, you're walking, cerebellum, your coordination. Uh, so therefore, the headaches, the swallowing, the double vision, all that stuff, it's just because this is being squeezed and that's being squeezed. Your nerves, they actually come here, they go out to your face, out to your body, and if they get stretched, you end up having those issues with hearing problems and double vision, a spinal cord right here, if that gets squeezed, the balance, weakness, you get the tingling pins and needles in your feet and your hands. Uh, next slide, please. So there's other issues. You know, we talked about the stuff. stuff. Earlier I showed you a slide where they had a picture of a brain with all these little arrows of fluid flowing through. Imagine the fluid trying to get through this traffic jam and now it's backed up and it's blocked. Well, this fluid will stay here and it'll actually expand the brain. You can end up having a lot of headaches and things of that nature. If it goes down and can't, can't get back up, it's blocked in the other direction. You can expand this, and you can end up what they call a stringomyelia or syrinx. I'm just going to say syrinx, it's easier to pronounce. Uh, tingling, numbness, walking balance issues from brain, but also spinal cord. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk about stringomyelia. I talked about it again. Here's that slide that we talked about with all the arrows uh, pointing at the flow. And you can see these, they go down, they go up. Imagine you just block that right there. It's going to stay here, and then all this. Fluid could build up here, and it could build up there. There's a line right here. I don't know if you guys can see this line right here. So, the, so this fluid uh, collection actually goes into this line, and that's the central canal. That's normal. It should just be a little pinhole. But if you block it, and the fluid backs up, you could end up having this long line of fluid just swelling your spinal cord. And you can see where you would have problems with balance and strength and weakness and numbness and tingling because your spinal cord is being kind of stretched out. The next slide, please. So here you can see a few more shots of, so here, here's bone, 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 uh, and then there's a the spinal cord and in the back of the neck, and all these pictures are the patient like this. So they're standing like this. So here's the front of the spine, the back of the spine, and the spinal cord here. And you can kind of see a gray line right there. And again, this right there is just all fluid right there. So your spine is right there, and then your spinal cord, and you can see there's almost no spinal cord here. It's just thinned out. The white stuff, I mean the black stuff, it's just spinal fluid, and the meat of the spinal cord is just thinned out like a balloon. This is, this is the worst picture because here's your spinal cord, and you can see that the fluid inside is just expanding the spinal cord like a balloon. So you can imagine this person probably has a really hard time using their hands, using their arms. They may have a problem breathing because this part of the spinal cord does control your breathing down to your diaphragm and your lungs. So this is kind of a life-threatening condition. Uh, next slide, please. So how do you evaluate for a PR? You know, the good old-fashioned uh, medical school always says you always see the patient, you listen to what they say, you talk to them, and you do a real thorough exam. In modern medicine, it's okay to skip a scan. We have examine the patient on a scan, but no, you really need to talk to the patient, get their story, because one patient will present with PR in one way, and another will present with PR in another way, and then there are patients who may have a little bit of protuberance, but they may have migraines, they may have seizures, they may have other things, so you got to make sure you know what the patient is saying, understand how this ties into their films. MRI is the gold standard, so most of the patients come to me, they do get an MRI. If they don't have an MRI, just start trying to get them one. For whatever reason, if they can't have an MRI, they have some sort of implant, they've been shot by a gun, and they have metal in their face or their arms, and they can't go into an MRI, you can do a CT myelogram. It's kind of a painful procedure, it's a little bit more antiquated. It's basically x-rays instead of magnets, so if you have an implant or a pacemaker, 
kind of CT myelogram to just inject some ink that goes in with the spinal fluid, and it kind of gives you a negative image of this, so you can see this jammed up uh, in the MRI CINE study. So the MRI CINE study is a wave of uh, flow that they look through, and they, what they do is they look for shift in patterns between the fluid, because your brain doesn't change, but fluid flow changes, so they look at the flow, and what I usually do with my patients, if I'm wondering, hmm, do they have Chiari or not, I'll make them get a CINE study, and during a CINE study, and they see in Sacramento, they make you bend forward, bend backwards, and look neutral, and we look at the flow through the back, the front, and see if there's any blockade, and if there is a blockade, well, then that may suggest that you're having uh, some degree of symptoms from the Chiari. Uh, next slide, please. So treatment options. Earlier today, I had another lecture talking about tumors, and same thing, you can watch them, do nothing, don't do surgery. The option number two is just medical treatment. Just treat the symptoms, pills, medicine, and things like that, or of course, surgery. So for observations, it's completely reasonable. Some patients come to me and they say, you know, I slipped on a banana peel, I went to the ER, they scanned me, told me I have a ER, do I need surgery? Do you have any symptoms? No. Nope. Well, then don't have surgery. So, so it's completely reasonable to observe a patient who, does, who may have radiographic Chiari who don't have symptoms. And there are some patients that I'm actually watching in my practice that might say, I get headaches here once in a while. Uh, when I'm under a lot of stress, I get some headaches. Um, some of them get a little dizzy, but uh, that's pretty rare. Do I need surgery? The answer is, well, no. You may have other issues, but it's, I'm not sure this Chiari is pretty symptomatic. So it's completely reasonable to observe patients who may not have dramatic symptoms. So there are some patients who may have symptoms that you want to treat, but they may not be ready for surgery for whatever reason. They said, I have had about a one-year history. I have headaches back here. My balance is not so great. Uh, I did some therapy. My balance is better. I take some pain medicine, some migraine medicine. My headache's better. I'm actually normal now. I feel pretty good. And my is terrible. Do I need surgery? And the answer is maybe not right now. You know, maybe in the future, or maybe never. Uh, and the surgery is what we're going to talk about uh, a little bit later on in, uh, in more detail. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so, so I took this from the Mayfield Clinic. So they actually have a very good uh, website. And so those of you guys who are looking at Chiari, you probably ended up going to the Mayfield Clinic and looking at stuff. There's a couple of doctors there that kind of really spearheaded a lot of the uh, Chiari uh, and the uh, skull-based surgery um, literature and, and research. And Mayfield Clinic, for those of you guys who don't know where that is, that's University of Cincinnati in Ohio. Uh, so, so basically, the tenet of surgery is a Chiari decompression. And there are several things that I do, and some people, the old school guys, they do some of this stuff. So what do I do? I do a suboccipital craniectomy. That's fancy of saying I remove some bone off the back, right back here. Uh, I do a C1 laminectomy. So we talked about how C1 is the first bone in some of the pictures. You saw that the tonsils were down to there. So I take some of that bone over there. Duroplasty. So I have this kind of in parentheses because not everybody does it. Uh, Duroplasty is basically I open the lining of the brain. So one thing I didn't talk about was that the brain actually is not just sealed with bone, but there's actually a sac around it, and that sac is leathery, and it's called the dura. And when you open it, you make more room. So here's the thing about duroplasty. What I tell people, and I'll go into a little bit more detail, I'm also going to get a little graphic. I don't know if they're really going to record this. Okay. You're at my eat buffet. You're really full. Your stomach's bulging out. What do you do? And undo one button. You feel better, right? That's a duroplasty. This is so tight, I just make an opening and make room, and instantly the tonsils are no longer squashed in the brainstem. That makes it a lot more useful. So, duroplasty, some people said, ah, you know, I don't really want to go into the brain as too dangerous. And others says, well, you got to. You have to release that button so you can let the, the tonsil bulge out. Otherwise, you haven't really released that tightness, and now they're still squashed. Um, resection of tonsils, I actually met a neurosurgeon uh, from Latin America who does that. And I read about it. Uh, I don't do it. No one else I know does it. But basically, back in the 80s and whatnot, uh, they used to actually start cutting away part of the brain stem, uh, the, the, the cerebellum, and remove that, and that gives you room. I don't think they do a duroplasty when they do that. So you can do one or the other. I prefer not to cut the brain, just cut the line of the brain. Uh, next slide, please. So, what is the surgery itself? So this is when I say surgical treatment of Chiari. This is the action right here. This is the reason why you have the hair. You can see the glory stuff. I don't make it too bloody, but I'll show you what we have here. So this is actually taken from a surgical text, and it's basically a patient who is ready for surgery. So you feel the back of the head. You feel a lump. You guys feel that? Go ahead. Just feel back there. You feel that lump back there. 
That's called the Indian or the occipital protuberance. Below that is a suboccipital area, and that's basically a flat piece of bone. So we want to shave from that bump all the way down. And in your neck, right here is another bump. That's C7. That's the seventh, seventh uh, bone in your neck. So I go about halfway between C7 to, your, to the Indian, and my incision goes from the, a little bit below the Indian to a little bit above that C7 bump back here. And so it's, it's not quite this generous, but that's basically the idea. It is midline. The patient's head is actually held in a frame, and we stole some, we borrowed some, uh, some images from the Mayfield Clinic. That's the Mayfield Clinic. So that's a Mayfield pin fixation system from the Mayfield Clinic in Cincinnati. So they really do know what they're doing over in Ohio. That's where I went to med school, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they, you hold the patient's head in a pin, and it's a three-point pin, and basically you just hold like this, and it goes right to the skull. So sometimes when patients wake up from surgery, they say, how come there are staples in the back, and I can staple on the side? Did you miss? And I'm, no, no, because when I took the pin off, it was bleeding, so I put a little surgical staple there. So not an uncommon question, and you can see where it goes off to the sides. Um, that's to hold the head perfectly still. You say, well, can you just put the patient's head in a little mass and let it just sit there on a the cushy donut? And the answer is, well, no, because the head will be wobbling during brain surgery. You don't want that, especially when you're drilling it. So we hold this pin real tight, and then I bind up the body so that there's actually no movement, very stable. We give IV access. There are some blood vessels back here called sinuses. They're really big veins. If you cut into it, that's bad. You know, you can have air embolism, patients can bleed to death. So you definitely want to be able to give blood back or give fluid to resuscitate the patient in the event that you have such a catastrophic, catastrophic outcome. <coughs> that never happened to me before, but it can. It is a risk. Uh, again, the head frame. So the way we have it is the surgery is going to be approaching in this direction. So I put them in the frame. So what do I do? I have them kind of tuck their head like this a little bit, so now there's a lot more room. And you can imagine if I'm operating back here, and the patient's like this, well, that takes up a lot of my room. So you, know, you want to open up that surgical space and make a little bit of room between C1 and the occiput, the base of the skull, so you can have a lot of working room to do your surgery. And of course, you want to pack the patient. I usually have the burrito rolled in, and I have them in a blanket, and I tape everything down, and I pack their elbows, their arms, their knees, their hips, their ankles, so that nothing is being pressed, because these surgeries can take two, three, four hours, and you don't want to have them pressed up against something funny and, 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 and push on this um, when, uh, when they're asleep, because if they wake up and there's a pressure sore, it can actually erode through the skin. It can be very debilitating. So you want to pad the patient. Of course, shave. I do a general shave in the back of the head. For the ladies, I take a ponytail, bring it forward, and I shave back here. So all this is clean, and when we're done with surgery, we let the ponytail go, the hair drops back. You can't tell they have brain surgery. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, oh, warning, it gets a little graphic at this point. <laughs> so here's the base of the skull. So Indian is right here, and this is right about here, that's right about there. And so we take our drills and we make two burr holes. The goal is really to release that one button on your tight jeans at the buffet. So I don't want to take, so this is a little bit exaggerated, I don't want to take away the entire fatless head. You don't need to do that. In fact, there were studies that looked at how much is the minimum that you want to remove. And about three centimeters to by one centimeter. So an area about this big and this big is really all you need to do. This is a little bit overkill. This is what we do to get into take out brain tumors back here. But the QR decompression, a little bit lower, so you don't have to take out the whole thing, just open up the, the front end. And so a three centimeter craniectomy with a one centimeter height is all we really need. And that keeps a lot of the things that we don't want to have happen to our patients from happening. And one of those things is when you remove the bone and you have a lining of the brain, which is sensitive and causes headaches, and your muscle grows onto it, you can give headaches to your patients. So we don't want to do that, so we want to keep the bony removal only to the critical area. Um, so I make these little holes, and then I, you see the hatch marks. You basically just put a drill, you follow it, and you literally pop it off. It just comes right out afterwards. And then now you're looking here. So here's the base of the skull looking from this direction, from the back, you have the right cerebellar and the left cerebellar uh, hemispheres. Brain stem is right here. Fermi mandrum is right there. Spinal cord is there. This back here is the first neck bone, C1, and here's C2, the second neck bone. Yeah, take a look at this red thing. What do you guys think that is? That's a blood vessel. I'm drilling here, and this is a blood vessel right where I'm drilling. I'm also doing a C1 laminectomy, so I'm drilling away. So during the talk, 
um, before surgery in my office, I show them a little model with this exact same picture, and I tell people, you do have blood vessels feeding your brain right now when it drills. So, so there is a risk to injury to those, strokes, death, paralysis. That's never happened before because we, we know where the landmarks are, so we don't go all the way up there. But I do have to remove this. Um, this is the dirt. This is not right. This is dirt. So underneath the sack of leathery uh, membrane is the brain itself. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So you can see some occipital craniectomy. Not taking out everything, but just kind of right here in the opening so you can give a little bit of breathing space to the brain stem and the toxils. See one by next to me, you can see the blood vessels right in that area, right there when you're working. So you have to be very careful in there. Here's what it looks like. You take out that much bone, there's a craniectomy for a man who used to be here. There's actually a thick leathery band that goes across, and you really have to open that band because it tucked it, it tuck, it's like you go into the IED buffet where you take out the first <laughs> button, but you're wearing really tight uh, underpants, that's no good. So you gotta release that so you can let, let them all hang out. Uh, and then usually I do a line right there after the next slide talks about that where I open this right there. C1 line right plane. So I think this picture is a little bit exaggerated because you can see C1 going right up against the blood vessel. So we don't take it quite that far because it's a little dangerous to be drilling right next to the blood vessel. But you kind of get the idea that you want to remove the blue part and have this exposed. So why do you want to take C1 off is the problem with the hair. And the answer is I want to open this area. Uh, next slide, please. It did go. In fact, <laughs> it's the same picture because at first I talked about the craniectomy and then that's about the, the C1 laminectomy. So next slide, please. All right. So you can see now that the dura has been opened. And you see C1 is right here. So now you understand why I must take C1 because I want to open this part. So if I open down here, I'm not really doing the job because I've opened past that. And now you can see the cerebellum. You can see the Brains, actually, no, this is a cerebellum right here. Brain stems in there, it's just totally squashed. And this area is just released. It's just kind of loosened and it's out. And you've made all this room here. So what do you do with all that room? Because now spinal fluid's going to leak out. You can get an infection, meningitis, and your patient's not going to do well. So you got to close it up. Uh, just to give you an idea, what's the, uh, the ca ca cadaver model? So again, C1, vertebral arteries, cerebellum, brain stem. Just like a cartoon. Uh, next picture, please. So what do I do? I put a patch on top. So I give a little bit more room to this belt line right there. And the thing I use is a bovine pericardium. That's exactly what I see in the heart of a cow lining. So the lining of a cow heart. And why do I choose that? And the reason why is because it's actually uh, inert. So what that means is that the lining of the heart, they just kind of cook it, they fry it, they nature it, and there's no protein, there's nothing funny, so your body will not attack it, you will not be allergic to it. Uh, and it looks just like rubber. If it looks like rubber, why don't you just use rubber? Because people are allergic to latex and rubber. So you don't want to put rubber in somebody and have them have an allergic response inside their head next to their brain. That's kind of bad. So bovine pericardium works really, really well. You can also use collagen, but the problem is that you can't really stitch collagen. In uh, 2007 and before, I used to just put a collagen membrane called Duragen on top, get some glue sprayed on top, and I'm done. And in 2007, I had a leak. So from 2007 until now, I stitch it in. It takes about an hour to stitch it in. And when I'm done doing this nice closure, there's no leak. It's completely dry. And then I have an anesthesiologist do a maneuver called Valsalva, where they hold the patient's breath to 37 inches of water, and they push. It's just like you on a toilet, Pushing while pregnant, delivering a baby, and coughing at the same time while constipated. <laughs> For 30 seconds straight. And I stop, I stop my Valsalva maneuver when I hear the patient fucking because now they're starting to cough against their, their bearing down. And I don't see a single drop of leak. At that point, I know I'm good. Uh, next slide. And that's when I put the glue on top. So I don't want to have another CSF leak ever in my life. Uh, and so far, in the last 12 years, I've had zero. Uh, because I do a patch and a glue on top, so belt and suspenders. So you definitely want to do that to make sure you have that issue. The other thing is that after surgery, I make patients sit up because you lay flat, there's more pressure. So if you sit up, you just drain away, so you also reduce that risk of uh, a leak as well. 
and I've asked them not to, uh, to do too much sneezing or anything like that. Uh, next slide. So congenital surgery, stroke. So we kind of talked about some of the blood vessels. You saw some of the blood vessels. Anytime you do brain surgery, yeah, you can create strokes. Strokes is nothing more than cutting off blood supply to parts of the brain and having the brain really not be happy about it. So if you injure a blood vessel and the brain is getting blood, it's going to have a stroke. It's pretty rare because the blood vessels are they're, they're, they're in known uh, anatomical locations. We know exactly where they are. If you cut into it, since you try to, not because you mistakenly cut into something. So really, it's pretty rare. Paralysis, uh, that's pretty rare, too. Uh, I, I guess you can accidentally hit the spinal cord of the brain. But in reality, this is an extra axial surgery, meaning that we're really working on the brain and aligning the, we're working on the skull and aligning the brain. I literally try not to touch the brain. One thing I didn't talk to you guys about is that there are three layers of aligning of the brain. The inner layer is called the pia. The second layer is called the arachnoid. And the top layer is the dura. If you talk about dura, I do cut that. The arachnoid is like a little saran wrap, except it's super delicate. It looks like spinal web. That's why I call it arachnoid. I try not to cut that, and that keeps it a CSF clean spot. Uh, so when I put my patch on, I'm not actually working in a pool of CSF. And that allows me to hopefully prevent CSF leaks in my patients, which is our next problem. Uh, CSF leaks, infections, meningitis, rare. Uh, so that's a true statement if you look at all three together. <coughs> CSF leaks are actually pretty common, but getting an infection of meningitis is rare because if you get a leak, it's pretty obvious. Most surgeons will then go ahead and fix it so you don't get an infection of meningitis. Infection of meningitis is bad. People can die from meningitis, and it can happen real fast. You get a CSF leak at 3 p.m. By midnight, you can be in an ICU shivering with absolute confusion and comatose. So it's bad. You don't want to have that. And that's why since 07, I've done the patch, I've done so, I sew it in, and then I do the Valsalva, and then I put the Dura seal on top, because I don't want to have any leaks. Pain, man, all my patients. I spend so much time talking about pain. This is the most painful surgery I do. It is because these muscles here hold your head, hold your arms, your shoulders, hold everything up. When you're sitting in front of a computer, these muscles are being used. When you're driving your car, these muscles are being used. When you're watching TV, these muscles are being used. When you're sleeping, you're leaning on these muscles. There's no way to escape it. If I have surgery on your legs, you can actually take pressure off. There's no way to take pressure off your neck unless you go to a swimming pool in the water or outer space. So <laughs> there's no way to, to take pressure off these muscles. And these muscles, they hurt and they send pain to your head, to your shoulders, to your back, to your arms. So a very common problem. My biggest problem after surgery is this guy right there. Numbness of scalp, also very common. Amazingly, almost all my patients have it. Some people don't notice it, but if you check, uh, check them, they're going to say, well, yeah, it's kind of numb. Later on, they'll say, hey, it's kind of itchy. And then they'll say, oh, it's burning. And then they'll say, oh, it's back to normal. And that's the nerve that I cut going into the skin. As they are cut, they're numb. And then as they grow back into the skin and, and, and grow back into its normal follicles, it starts to get itchy. And it starts to feel a little funny. And then it goes back to normal about six, six months later. Uh, next slide, please. So outcomes. So 82% early improvement of pre-op symptoms. So for those of you guys who are thinking about um, Chiari said, oh good, I can have early, so early improvement of pre-op symptoms doesn't mean that when you wake up from surgery, it means like three months. So three months after surgery, eight out of ten patients are going to come back and say, man, I feel pretty good. Uh, why is it three months? Because pain that I caused during surgery is about three months to go away. And when that goes away, then you're going to get the benefits of the surgery itself. Uh, but it does improve greatly. The first couple of weeks, it's pretty rough. Uh, I've had patients go to the ER after ER after ER, and I tell them beforehand, uh, what to do, uh, how to overcome it, but it's still pretty painful. And I think most people don't realize the severity of the pain uh, after surgery. Uh, it does drive them to the ER. And unfortunately, the ER, once they hear you have brain surgery, and they're not going to touch you with anything. They're going to do nothing for you. So don't go to the ER, just call me. Uh, weakness. So a lot of patients do have improvements. Uh, obviously, if your hands are completely shriveled up and your muscles are wasted away and you have no muscles in your hands, not a whole lot of surgery is going to do for you, but we do see improvements in, uh, in their strength in their hands and their walking and whatnot. Sensation, absolutely that can improve as well. So those pins and needles, once you take pressure off that spinal cord and brain stem, it does improve. Uh, next slide, please. So I didn't really talk a whole lot about syrinx, and the reason why is because whenever you get a syrinx, the treatment is a QRD. Uh, there are treatment options for syrinx, and I, I will say of all the patients that have Chiari's and syrinxes, by doing a Chiari surgery, within six months to 12 months, I go follow MRI and the cervical spine, Chiari's on. 
I've never actually had to go in and fix one. So I would say it's probably going to be a very high resolution rate. I think the literature shows that it's about 80% of the time you do the survey for Chiari, the series will go away. So the remaining 20%, there are things you can do. And so one thing we can do, we can actually fenestrate the, the serum. So that's the fancy little saying, hold, hold it and let it drain out. Um, unfortunately, of course, it'll seal up, it'll build up again, right? Well, not really. If you're already taking the Chiari, the fluid shouldn't rebuild up. But just in case, people who have uh, water in the air, the otitis media, they have a little bit of uh, air infection, the air nose and throat doctors, they'll put a little tube in there, uh, and that drains it. And so a lot of a lot of surgeons, they'll put a small little air tube in here, and they stitch it in, and that's what I do. I stitch it into the, the top layer of the, uh, the lining called the pia that we talked about, and that holds it there, and then you put a little bit of glue, and then you leave it there, and then it scars in, and then it'll just constantly drain the fluid out, and it'll close up, and that's it, it's treated. If it doesn't work, you have to put a shunt in. And the shunts, they fail at 100%. Uh, I read 100% if you go long enough. And it's a little tube that goes into here, and you take it and you pass it into the stomach, and it just drips into the stomach. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, that's it. Hey, I want to thank Mercy Dignity Health. Uh, I want to thank CSF Foundation for having me today. I want to thank Mr. Moran for, uh, for being able to be out and inviting us.